Today, we want to start off with a couple of line integrals. We're going to take this vector field, 2xi plus 3y squared j. And then we have these two different paths. We're going to do two different line integrals. One along C1, which is the quarter circle from 0, 2 to 2, 0. And C2, which is just the line from 0, 2 to 2, 0. Most of the work, as usual, is going to be wrapped up in parameterizing our curves. So we know that we can create a, quarter, a circle by um, having x equal cosine and y equal sine. But that would start off at the positive x-axis and go uh, counterclockwise. Here, I want to start off at the positive y-axis and go clockwise. So what I want to do is reverse the roles of x and y. So the parameterization for C1 If we set R of T, let's call it R. Do I want a subscript? Well, whether I wanted to or not, I just did. If I want to start off the positive Y axis, I can make the Y cosine and the X sine. So if I parameterize this as sine TI, plus cosine of T times J, by switching the roles of the X and Y, we can get our circle to go clockwise and start off at the positive Y axis. However, the radius of the circle that I want to travel along is two. So I'm gonna to have to adjust my amplitudes to two. The thing to note about here is that we're not, we're le less creating this and more remembering this. So right now we're just all gonna have to pretend that we remember we can reverse the order and uh, that if we switch the order, our circle will start at the positive Y axis instead of the part of the positive X axis and it'll go around clockwise instead of counterclockwise. That was just a memory check. Originally, when I wrote this problem, I was going to go from 2, 0 to 0, 2. But I remembered we did that parameterization yesterday. And I don't want everybody to get bored with the same curves. What we're going to be computing is the line integral. So the parts that we need, we're trying to comp compute a line integral along an oriented curve of a vector field dot dr. And dr is just the direction along the curve. Oh, we forgot a thing. We're gonna do this parameterization for t from zero to pi over two. Forgot the quarter circle part. So we need to put in the parts. And what we need is dr, which is going to be the derivative of our parameterized curve. It's just the direction. So our dr1, the derivative of sine is cosine. So it's going to be 2 cosine t i. And the derivative of cosine is negative sine, minus 2 sine of t times j, all this times dt. We're just taking the derivative of r1 with respect to t, so dr dt, and then I'll multiply both sides by the dt. This will go directly into my line integral. That'll give us the dt that we need, and we'll integrate the values of t. So. Our line integral uh, over C1 of f dot dr1 is going to be the integral 
of the vector field 2xi plus 3y squared j dot dr, which is uh, 2 cosine of ti minus 2 sine of t j dt. We have to integrate over the values of t that we're using. That's from 0 to pi over 2. We also have to replace our vector field. We have to evaluate our vector field along the curve. So I'm going to replace x and y with uh, 2 sine of t and 2 cosine of t. So let's do that. So our integral becomes the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 2 times 2 sine of t i plus 3 times 2 cosine t squared times j dot dr dot. dr is still the same. And we're still integrating from 0 to pi over 2. Remember, the integral, it, we're evaluating the vector field along the curve. So it makes sense to just replace the x and y in the vector field with the x and y from our parameterized curve. So now we've got this all the way down to just an integral dt. A while ago, we had a couple of days ago, not a while ago, that would kind of mean today, but might have been last week, we mentioned that a line integral was a generalized simple integral because we're integrating along a one-dimensional thing. Just like when we integrate a function of one variable, we're integrating along an interval, a one-dimensional thing. We're just now dealing with a vector field instead of a function of one variable and a curve instead of just an interval. That's why this is so much more interesting than that, even though we get bogged down in details. So we need the dot product. Of, so I got the i times the i. So I got 4 sine t times cosine t. Oops, no, 8. 8 sine t cosine t. Uh, 3 times 2. Oh, this is going to be. I'm not going to be able to do this in my head. Students that are familiar with my work know it's like, oh, dude, you're not going to be able to square that, multiply, and then multiply by something else. And I'm like, oh, totally, you're totally right. So I get um, this is going to be four cosine squared t, and then times three is twelve cosine squared t. And it's going to be minus when I multiply. So minus twelve times two is twenty-four um, sine t cosine squared t. and all this dt. So hopefully I was able to do some algebra. So we're calculating a dot product, so we don't need the i and j. So I multiply the i times the i, and then the j times the j, and the dot product is going to give us a scalar. And so here is the integral that we want to integrate.
Any questions? So we got to think about um, So uh, for the first question, how do I get two sine of t? The two sine of t came from our, this two sine of t here came from our parameterization, um, r1 of t. So when we want to parameterize a circle that goes clockwise, starting at the positive y-axis, that circle is parameterized with sine of t, uh, two sine of t, two cosine of t. The two is there to be the radius, because notice that the radius of the circle is two. So that's where the two sine of t came from and also the two cosine of t. That came from our parameterization. And for the other question, the integration is not gonna tell us the area under the line C2. What we're doing is we're calculating a vector field. So this vector field is two x, uh, and three y. So there's all these vectors moving along. There's all these vectors at each point on this curve. And we're finding the dot product of the direction of the curve, a line tangent to the curve, a vector tangent to the curve, and the vectors in the vector field. So now we have to calculate this integral. If you're looking at this integral and think this looks kind of awful, that's only because it's kind of an awful, actually it's not so bad because I've got an odd sine t. So we can do this integral by uh, we can do this integral by substitution. I fell into the classic student trap because I had just been talking in my trigonometry class about double angle integrals and we just reviewed double angle integrals. And so I'm like, oh, sweet, I can use a double angle integral. And I was gonna use a double angle integral over here. And I'm like, oh, dude, what are you doing? You have an odd power of sine and cosine. You can just do substitution. I can just say W is equal to cosine, then DW is gonna be sine. So I've got this factor of sine of T. So if we factor out a sine of t, I can look at this as eight cosine of t minus 24 cosine squared of t times sine of t dt. So we can just do this integration by substitution. So if we let w equal cosine of t, then dw is just minus sine of t dt. And so minus dw is sine of t dt. Any questions? The important thing to recognize here is that we are getting distracted by all these extra calculations that we have to do. We have to jump back into the mathematical time machine and remember how to integrate products of powers of trig functions. This is all just distraction. Remember what we're doing. We're evaluating this vector field at all the points along this curve and then finding the dot product of the vector field and the direction that the curve is headed. It all worked out to this dt integral, and now we're stuck in this friggin' dt integral. No problem though, we got this. So we're integrating no longer from zero to pi over two because I'm replacing my dt integral with a dw integral, but it's just going to be eight times w minus 24 times w squared and sine of t dt is a minus one 
times dw. But we're not integrating from zero to pi over two. We've tried that. Those are values of t. That's t goes from t equals zero to pi over two. And this is now a dw integral. So integral says, look at me, look at me. I'm a dw integral now. So when t equals zero, we just have to evaluate w. So if t is equal to zero, I get w is cosine of zero, which is one. So instead of integrating from zero to pi over two, we'll start our integration at one. And when t is equal to pi over two, w is the cosine of pi over two, which is equal to zero. So we're no longer integrating t from zero to pi over two. We can integrate w from one to zero. Important thing to note, my original integral started at zero, t equals zero and ended at t equals pi over two. I have to maintain that same order, even though you don't like it when the integral says from one to zero. You don't get to let that bother you. You just have to maintain that order. You can't just start switching the order around because we know if we switch the order of integration, we change the sign. If you don't like it, you can realize that you've got this negative hanging out in front. So you can rewrite this integral as the integral from zero to one of eight w minus 24 w squared to w. Change the sign and change the order and that maintains balance. The other thing I like about changing the endpoints of our integration is that we not have to go back to dt. I don't have to replug in my cosines. I just need to continue on with w's. So I'll have the integral of 8w is 4w squared minus the integral of 24w squared is going to be 8w to the third. Okay, yeah. And then I'll evaluate from 0 to 1. So I'll have a four times one squared minus eight times one to the third minus zero, negative four. All that to come up with a negative four. So what does this negative four represent? Um, that depends. What did our original dot product represent? What is our vector field measuring? What is our vector field measuring? And what is our path representing? We can make this whatever we want. Anything that we can use a dot product for, anything that we we're trying to calculate a dot product, we can calculate with this. Maybe the force is a force field and the path is a path that we're trying to walk through that force field. So our integral will represent work. Work will be force times distance. Any questions? So we have uh, 24w squared, we integrate. So we add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. That's a great response to the any questions. None that I can formulate into actual words at this time.
And sometimes that's the case in math. That's what makes math so fun. You're like, oh, I am super confused. I just don't know what question to ask, which is absolutely the right answer. We're trying to get to places where we don't even know what question to ask. And that means we have to take this stuff and then just like write it down again and think what's going on with all this business. Then we'll recognize, shoot, this was only half of the problem. I wanted to evaluate this line integral over both of these curves. I saved the harder one for first. And so the second one is just a line. So now we have to um, integrate this line integral over C2. So C2 is the line segment from 0 to 2 to 0. So we need to parameterize this curve. But the nice thing is it's just a line segment. So X and Y are both going to be lines. So I'm going to call this R2 of T. So I'll change the indexing and the color of our curve. So there's a lot of simple stuff going on here. Um, I'm going to set, say 0, 2 happens when t is equal to 0, and 2, 0 happens when t is equal to 1. This is for convenience. With line segments, just make one end at 0, the other end at 1. So we could see what happens to the x. If I make a table of values, when t is 0, x is 0, and when t is 1, x is 2. So the x starts at 0 and increases by 2 whenever t increases by 1. y starts off at 2 and drops down to 0. So for y, we'll start off at 2 and decrease by 2 when t increases by 1. So x is 0 plus 2t, and y is 2 minus 2t. So when t is equal to 1, we subtract 2 from 2 one time. When t is equal to 1, we add 2 to 0 one time. So our hour of t looks like 2ti plus 2 minus 2t times j. We still need to calculate our line integral stuff. That means I need the directions. I need the dr. And I just take derivatives through. So the derivative of 2t is 2. And the derivative of 2 minus 2t is negative 2. This is dr dt, so I'll multiply both sides by dt. And my line integral will now be an integral dt. So my line integral, oh, I kind of set it up here, but t is going to go from 0 to 1. So my integral over C2 of f dot dr2 is going to be an integral of f which I conveniently forgot, 2xi plus 3y squared j. Dots the dr, which in this case is a 2i minus 2j dt. And I integrate over all the values of t, which in this case is from 0 to 1. And these are t's.
Just like before, my vector field is all in terms of x and y. I only care about the x and y along this curve. So I'm going to put in my x and y parameters. So we'll have the integral from 0 to 1 of 2 times 2t. Two I plus three times two minus two t squared times j. That's the vector field evaluated at uh, along this curve, and we still have the dot product with the dr. And we're still integrating dt, so this is still going to go from 0 to 1. Now we just need to find the dot product. Then we'll have a nice uh, scalar function of t, and we can integrate it. And it looks like it's going to be a polynomial, so start with the messy one first. because I used up a lot of energy on that first one. So the first one's gonna be messy with the substitution. We're gonna get a little bit lost in the weeds. We're gonna to have to remind ourselves partway through what we were calculating in the first place. So we don't look back and think, how did we get here? Sometimes math problems are like miniature alien abductions. You like look back at a page of work, it's like, oh, wait, where did all this come from? I'm missing some time here. So I need uh, 4t times 2. So I'm going to have 8t. Uh, I am not, even though it's just algebra, I'm, I, I'm man enough to admit that I can't, I can't just multiply this. It's too early. And I don't know if I've had too much coffee or too little coffee. But So I'm going to have uh, 4 uh, minus 8t plus 4t squared. And then that gets multiplied by 3. And then that gets multiplied by negative 2. So I have to multiply this by negative 6. So I have minus 24 plus 48t minus 24t squared. So hopefully that came out all right. I got like terms. So I've got a negative 24 um, plus 4016t minus 24t squared dt. This is why I started with the messy one first. You could see all the slowdown in my processor going on right now. Even though the problem is simpler, it's taking longer because the processor is overtaxed. Clearly overclocking the processor right now. And it is caught fire. That's OK. I'll put the fire out with coffee. So negative 6 is because we're finding a dot product. I had to. Um, Square the 2 minus 2t, 2 minus 2t squared. It's getting multiplied by 3. And then since this is the j, I have to multiply that by the j on the second vector. So a 3 and a negative 2 make the negative 6. It only seems like a lot to keep track of because it's a lot to keep track of. And you have to keep track of all of it, or it'll mess up your problem. Now I need to evaluate at uh, from 0 to 1. So I'll evaluate, uh, I'll find the antiderivative. So negative 24t plus half of 56t squared. So 25, 28. Uh, minus 8t cubed evaluated from 0 to 1. So at one, 
we'll have negative 24 times one plus 28 times one squared minus eight times one cubed. Minus then when we plug in zero, we'll get zero. So negative eight and 28 is 20 minus 24 is negative four again. I see the comment reaches for coffee pot. Yes, let's all do drugs. Caffeine is my favorite. I can just buy it at my local supermarket. And no one questions it. Go to the supermarket and buy two kilos of coffee. No one bats an eye. Oh, but when I try to fly in with two kilos of heroin, everybody's like freaks out. I'm just kidding. Never, I've never smuggled heroin. It was cocaine. I'm just kidding. I've never smuggled cocaine anywhere. All right. So at this point, we notice that we got the same value, negative four, and it could be a coincidence but since I just said it could be a coincidence, we know that it's totally not just going to be a coincidence. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said anything. I would have said, huh, interesting. We got the same value. The reason that we got the same value is that the vector field is a gradient field. So the reason that we got the same value is that the vector field is a gradient field. That is the vector field that we're integrating is the gradient of some function of two variables. So F is the gradient of X squared plus Y cubed. So remember gradient. So now I'm pulling yet another thing from our past into the present problem. This is a pretty strong indication of how I am as a dungeon master in Dungeons and Dragons. If you hand me a backstory, that's where I'm gonna get my villains. Just gonna bring all that stuff in. So our vector field is a gradient field. Gradient fields are path independent. Gradient fields are path independent. And that means just like it, that means exactly what it sounds like it means. It doesn't matter what path we take, all we care about is where we start and where we finish. We started off at zero two and we ended at, wait, is that where we started? Yeah, we started off at zero two and we ended at two zero, that's all that matters in this line integral because our vector field 
is a gradient field. And what we have just run into is the fundamental theorem of calculus. That says the integral over C of some gradients of F dot dr is just F at I did need to write some stuff, that's fine. F at Q minus F at P, where C is any path from P to Q. That's the path independent part. C is any path from P to Q. If we're integrating a vector of gradient field, we only care about the endpoints, where it starts and where it ends. So if I take uh, x squared plus y cubed, so if I start off at, I was overconfident in the amount of space that I had. <laughs> This always happens. There's always like gobs of space between the lines at the top of the page, and then it just like crams down to the bottom. This is called the toothpaste principle. So if we start off at zero two, and we go to two zero. So here's the point P, and here's the point Q. And I look at my uh, function x squared plus y cubed, the vector field that we were integrating, two xi plus three y squared j, is the gradient of x squared plus y cubed. I start off at q at um, 2 squared plus 0 cubed. So I have 2 squared plus 0 cubed minus uh, this function x squared plus y cubed at the point to uh, 0, 2 minus 0 squared plus two cubed, it's gonna be four minus eight. Like we said previously, line integrals are just generalizations of our simple integrals. So it makes sense that we see a version of the fundamental theorem of calculus that we can apply to line integrals. Otherwise, our fundamental theorem wouldn't be so fundamental if we had to completely change it up just because we're dealing with line integrals, which are supposedly generalizations of our single variable integrals from before. That's our fun revelation for today. We got to the fundamental theorem of calculus again, this time in the context of line integrals. And heck, it looks the same. Because how do we get the gradient? We take a bunch of derivatives. So in one sense, the gradient of f is the derivative of a function of two variables. Notice that this gradient of f and this f of q minus f of p, this doesn't specify anything about the number of variables that we're using. So if we had a function of three variables, it would be the same. If we had a function of 15 variables, it would be the same, just messier. But from a certain point of view, this is the same as the fundamental theorem of calculus we had before, which said that the integral of, from A to B of F prime dx is F at B, minus F at A. But instead of a function of one variable like we have had before, we've got a function of two variables. So the derivative, the closest relative to the, just the straight up derivative is the gradient.
it all fits together so well. This is why this is my favorite subject. All right, that's going to do it for today. I will see y'all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.